Be honest. How they... I'm going to say a joke. <laughs> That's how we do things here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there was a Sunday school, uh, fourth graders, um, eight, nine, ten year olds, and, and um, they, they were always taught in Sunday, and if anybody has heard this, don't say anything, please. Um, they were always taught that, you know, every answer when we ask a question is Jesus. It's Jesus. If you ask a question, well, who's Savior? Jesus. So they came to a point where the teacher said, okay, I'm going to ask you something. I want you to tell me who this person is or who this is. So the teacher goes, okay, this person is very furry. It's got a hump. It walks funny. And it's got a little tail shaking like this. And it spits. One of the kids raised his hand and he goes, yes, pick a name. He goes, it sound, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds to be a lot like a camel. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that it's all about Jesus. And please feel free to amen something we say. It's all about Jesus. And, G and the title of the message today is Jesus, Friend of Sinners. It's a great song by Casting Crowns actually called Jesus, Friend of Sinners. I'm not going to play it now. It would be four minutes long and I'm not going to do that to you. But I will say, listen to it. Because Jesus is truly a friend of sinners. We come here today, I want to introduce to you, if you don't know this Jesus as a friend of sinners, because let me tell you something, I am not ashamed to say I'm standing up here by his grace only because I was once a sinner. I still am a sinner, saved by grace. Saved by grace. That's it. And that's what we have to understand. So if you have Bibles, if you don't, get your iPhones out and, and you know, flip through it. Look... Go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. I love the book of Mark. It is an active book. I have it up here, actually. Okay. <laughs> I did this late yesterday. Forgive me. And this thing is bothering me. What is in this thing? It's the Bible coming out, hitting me in my leg. Mark chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. I want, I want through this little text here, it's only... Five verses, four or five verses, I want us to see Jesus, that he truly is a friend of sinners. We're going to be introduced to someone here today that we all know of, or many of us don't know, but we will get to know. So Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? I'm just envisioning that's how they said it. Maybe not. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, I love this verse, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Understand that the word righteous there doesn't mean like righteous. It means self-righteous. That's what they're trying to say, those because the Pharisees were self-righteous. So Jesus is a friend of sinners. I have Three points that I, I, I want to bring light to you guys out of these five verses. And the first thing I want you guys to see is that Jesus sees what we don't. Jesus sees what we don't. And that's found in verses 13 and 14. You know why I love Jesus? Because Jesus sees people like we don't. Because we'll look at people and we'll say, oh. But Jesus looks at him and says, you know what I see? I see a masterpiece. I see a finished product. And that's the first thing he sees. He sees a finished product. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses, uh, Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are God's handiwork. The word there is masterpiece. Actually, in the Greek, it's poem. poem. We're, we're God's poem. 
You ever read a poem that's not nice? I guess you can, right? But anyway, poems are meant to be nice. You know, it's just Valentine's Day, roses are red, violets are blue, your smile is like sunshine, and you smell very nice too. I just made that up now. <laughs> Philippians 1.6 is another verse that is very um, powerful how God sees you. You know how God sees you? This is what it says. It says, being confident of this, that he who, had, who begun a good work in you will carry it out unto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know what that verse tells me? That tells me that when, what God started, he doesn't finish. I mean, he, he finishes. Sorry. Whoa. John, is that the right message? What God starts, he finishes. We have to first understand who Levi is. Does anyone know who Levi is, by the way? Just, just no? Levi? Thank you. Matthew. He was a tax collector. I guess a lot of us are getting our taxes ready now. We're not very happy with the tax people right now. So back then it was even worse, to be honest with you. You think the IRS is hated now? They were hated worse then. They worked for the enemy. I guess it works both ways now. Um, so they would tax everything and high. And basically, if I'm a um, pilot, let's say, or, or, or Herod, I hire a tax collector, a Jew working for the Romans, Go tax your own people, tax them high, give me my share, and you keep the rest. Tax collectors were also very wealthy. Very, very wealthy. People knew they were cheats. People knew they were extortionists. It was a big deal. See, what, what, you're like, I don't, what's the point of this? Okay, the point is this. God sees what we don't see. How? Why would God choose Levi? Of all the people, he walks right by him and he says, you follow me. You follow me, Levi. And then I read the rest of my Bible and I see the kind of men and women God uses. And we sometimes scratch our heads, right? We're like, really? Did you guys know that one of Jesus' descendants was a prostitute named Rahab? I mean, think about the logic in that. And that's why I love Jesus, because he sees a finished product. Today you're like, well, I don't know if God can use me. See, I think that's an insult, personally. That's an insult. And we at times, sometimes, um, and I'm guilty of this big time too, we lift up pastors, we lift up teachers, we lift up evangelists to be above who they truly are. All they really are are sinners saved by grace. And they're just being used by the Lord. So I believe it's a big deal. We are, by the way, if, if, if you don't know the Lord, we'll introduce you to the Lord later. But understand this, that those that know the Lord, those that call themselves Christians, those that profess, that believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and my sins, and he rose from the dead three days later to give us life, you're chosen. You're a chosen people. You are a chosen people. So when we go back to Levi now, you have to understand something. You know what the word Levi means? Always, when you read your Bible, names in the, in the Jewish tradition mean something. I know they mean something in Arabic too. They mean something in a lot of languages. Names mean something. The word Levi, you know what it means? It means joined. Joined to what? To the world. He was joined to the world. Levi was joined to the world. But when my brother here said who he became, who did he become? Matthew. What does Matthew mean? It means gift of God. You see, you may come before God and say, I am joined to the world, or I am liar, or I am whatever you want to call yourself. And Jesus says, says to you, he says, no, you're not. If you believe in me, you are now a new creation. You are teacher, you are pastor, you are evangelist, you are Sunday school teacher, you are a godly mother, a godly father. 
You see, too many people try to measure up to God's standard. See, the difference, and, and, and this is not here, but it's important. The difference between religion of the world, as, as, as it's said, and, and Jesus is two different, very easy. Religion, and my kids have heard this, religion is uh, man's way, uh, man's attempt to reach God. Try to be perfect, try to do the right thing, say the right thing, I want to do that. Jesus is God's way, God's attempt to reach man. Different. He's the one that reaches out. He's the one that goes and hangs on the cross. I don't see Muhammad doing that. I don't see Buddha doing that. And by the way, they're all dead. My God's alive. My God's alive. And that's, that's, that's the whole difference. In Jeremiah 31, 3, the Bible says, the Lord has, has appeared to me of old saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Does that say anything to you? You know that God's lo God loved you before you were born? God loved you before you were born. I don't know if that means, that does everything to me. It does everything. That means when God looked, I don't know where, he's like, okay, I love John, even though I wasn't John yet. I wasn't even formed. The world hated this guy, Levi. He hated, they hated him. And for, honestly, for good reason. He cheated them. But Jesus loved them. A lot of us today, you know what? I grew up, I grew up in North Bergen. I grew up in a high school that, you know, that was kind of crazy. You know? Uh, in, my, in my town, you, you either fit in or you didn't. That's how it was. And I know it's like that. I mean, just being around the teenagers, being around the, the, the youth, I know that today, the way the world is, either you fit in or you don't. And when you don't fit in, you try to fit in. And sometimes in trying to fit in, you do the wrong thing. But you can't do that. You see, Jesus loves you the way you are. And that goes for old to young. Because even the old people, and I'm getting old now, it, we're guilty. We're guilty of trying to do the right thing to fit in. But Jesus, you know, I always tell the kids, don't fit in, fit out. Get out of the circle of people. Amen. Get on the path with Jesus. Look to the cross. I love Matthew. Jesus says, Follow me. And Matthew, instant surrender. Instant surrender. He got up. He was, you know what it is? And, and, and it's good to understand this, but something about Jesus' eyes. If you look in the Bible, read it very carefully. A lot of people Jesus talks to, I guess it's the way he looks at them. It's that piercing. You know, some people look at you, you're like, you're scared. You're, it's like a piercing through your heart. But Jesus pierced you through your heart in a loving manner. As a father looks on a child, that's exactly how he looks at us. Too many people have this image of God with, a, with, the, with the, the, the rod in one hand and the Ten Commandments in the other hand, pacing around heaven like this angry God. The Bible says God is compassionate, full of mercy. Now look, don't misunderstand. Don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not up here saying God's not righteous and he's not just. He does deal with sin. But right now, this time right now, from the time that Jesus rose from the dead until now is called the dispensation of grace. It's like, it's a grace period. He's calling you today and he's saying either you do or you don't. Because afterwards, there's no do-overs in heaven. There's no do-overs, sadly. This is very serious for me because you know what? We all walk blindly sometimes. And one day, something smacks us right in the face. And, and, I, and I'm praying it's Jesus today. In a loving manner. In a loving manner. Because let me tell you something. This world is dark. You ever watch the, you ever watch the news? I got a new phone. I mean, I don't even need to, I, I have to, I, this is my timer. I'm not gonna show you the time. Um, it, it, it opens with a fingerprint. Um, the other day, we got something in the mail for the pool, for the Crestkill pool. You don't need a card anymore. You just run your finger underneath it, and they read your veins now. Okay, so tell me, and you know they created a chip, right? It's in your dogs if you have one. I'm just saying, be very careful. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. What if there's no tomorrow? What if there's no, this is not to scare you, it's to prepare you. 
You know, it's like um, there's a burning house. Someone's inside. Yeah! They're not saying that, but inside they're saying it. Ah! And you're going to walk by. And you're going to say, come. Look, there's a slide right to the right right there. Go ahead, take it. And they're going to ignore it. I know I to went totally off my notes. I apologize, Lana. Sorry, completely. <laughs> totally. Let me skip down a little bit. <laughs> Levi, Matthew, surrendered immediately. Immediately. And let me tell you something. Jesus desires, not John, because I'm, I'm not the Christ, as John the Baptist said. I'm not the Christ. Jesus desires obedience. He desires surrender today. In fact, John 14, 15 says what? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know what, let I keep that up there. Okay, you see that word keep? You know what the, the original translation of that is in the Greek? Basically, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus assumed that you will. How many people today say, I love you, Jesus? They go outside, hey, do this. No, no. Talk to that person. No, I won't do that. I can't do that. They'll laugh at me. So? So what? I am very grateful that I have very bold youth members. They're very bold. They've invited some friends. Welcome. It's awesome. We need to be bold. It's the older generation that's less bold. We need to be bold. We need to get out there and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. He's a friend of sinners. Come on in. Come party with the rest of the sinners. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. Jesus didn't save you to leave you. He didn't. He doesn't save you. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't say, come forward, pray a prayer. Okay, cry a little bit. Good. Now go back to your seat. Okay, sit there for the next 60 years and die. That's not what he said. Jesus said what? Matthew 28. He said, all authority has been given unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all men. Go. Get, get, go away. He doesn't say it that way. Some of the new people are like, dude, this guy's weird. I was like, is he going to say it? Is he going to make a point? I'm a firm believer that, that when, you, when you obey the Lord, blessings will follow. I think blessings follow obedience. Today, if you're a Christian and, and, and your life is, I guess, if you're like, I'm not being used by the Lord. I'm not being used. I want to be used by. You know what? Ask yourself, Lord, is there something in my life that I'm not obeying you with? Is there something I'm not doing that you want me to do? Let me tell you something. I think that right there is the breaking point. Everything changes when you obey. Everything. I don't know your life. I really don't. But Jesus knows your life. In John chapter 1, actually John chapter 2, Jesus said actually, he is, um, if you notice in, in the Bible a lot, many people would come. Jesus sometimes would just would say things to them, but it would be like, you're like, whoa, why did he say that? Because the Bible says he knew the true heart of man. You can't fool the Lord. Don't misunderstand. Don't be here. Oh, go outside and do something else. Because God's going to be like, are you kidding me? Like, really? Keep your arm raising to yourself. And, and look, you're like, you're being, I'm not being harsh. I'm not being harsh. I'd rather tell you than not tell you. Jesus was radical. You guys read the Bible? Read Matthew through John. Jesus was crazy. He went from, he would pick up a baby, uh, and then he would turn around to the Pharisees and say, you wicked brood of vipers. Why? Because he was after love. He was after grace. He was after salvation. And if people got in the way of that, it bothered him. He was radical. If he called you, it means he wants to use you. Jesus doesn't call sleepwalking Christians. He wants to use you. He wants to use you. Don't ask why. Don't argue with him. Just say, where? Where do you want to use me? Because he could use you in school. He could use you at work. He could use you at your own house. <clears throat> There's a great story I read um, back in the 1500s. Uh, there was these uh, sculptors that got together and uh, they had this huge marble granite. Big, but it was just one big block. Right? And um, if you guys don't know, you guys know Donatello, not the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, the, the artist. Donatello, 
he came and he looked at it and he goes, no, I don't want it. It's got imperfections. I don't want it. So they were like, okay. So they left it in the cathedral because they wanted someone to sculpt something. They actually wanted someone to sculpt a, um, an Old Testament prophet. So this, this block of, of, of granite just stood in the cathedral courtyard for weeks and weeks and weeks. Finally, an artist, a, uh, an artist came and saw it. And he looked at it, and he saw something in it, and he took it. Many weeks later, or I, I forgot how, what the story was, but many you know, times later, let's say months later, he gathered all the great uh, uh, artists, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, um, Botticelli, and uh, the, 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 the teacher of Raphael. You ever notice the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? That's pretty cool. Um, and then the teacher of Raphael. He had a veil over it. He pulled the veil down and everybody was like, <gasps> it was Michelangelo's David. You see, we come before the Lord sometimes as a block of granite. We're granite. We have imperfections. But see, only Jesus sees David behind the block. He has to sometimes chip a little bit here, cut a little bit here, smooth a little bit here. But in the end, you're a masterpiece. We have to believe that though. See, too, we walk around with chips on our shoulders and we beat ourselves up for sins that Jesus said it's buried already. It's gone. I buried it in death and I gave you new life. So Jesus sees what we don't see. Let's uh, move over to the next one. I know I had a quote in there. You know what? Let me read this. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite teachers, said, God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. He wants to do a work in you. He wants to do a work in you. Let him. The second thing, I got some time. The second thing, we see Jesus, friend of sinners, is he goes where others won't. He goes where others won't. Before I get to this, notice the first thing Matthew did. Did you guys see it in there? You find it in verse, <clears throat> excuse me, you find it in verse 15. It says that he was dining in Levi's house. Actually, in, in Luke chapter 5, it says that Matthew threw a great feast or a banquet. Why do you think he did that? There's, uh, this is not, this is me, John wrote it. I, this is, you know, by the Holy Spirit, you know, I wrote this, this is what I, this is why I believe. Three reasons why he, he did this. Number one, it's not there, Laura. I don't think it is there. Number one, he wanted to show his friends who he is now, who Matthew is now. Hey guys, I'm a new creation. Come, hang out. I'm a new creation. Number two, he wanted to show them who changed his life. Who changed his life? I want to introduce you who made me a new creation. And number three, he was just happy. He was overjoyed because Jesus chose him and he couldn't help but to celebrate. I said it before, too many walking dead Christians like Eeyore. We walk around sad. We shouldn't be sad. We should be rejoicing. And by the way, can I just say this out loud here? There's a party here every Sunday. We rejoice that we know Jesus. Tell people and invite them to the party. Tell them to come here and meet the Lord. Matthew, the minute he was saved, what did he do? That's cute. The minute he was saved, what did he do? He told his friends. He only knew bad people, by the way. He didn't know good people. Tell some people what Jesus has done to your life and what he can do, and I believe he could do a lot. If he uses me, he can use anybody. And, and, you know, God is, like I said before, God is a God of the living, not of the dead. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, the Bible says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, Matthew understood this. Do we understand it? Bought at a price. A lot of people say, great, you know, yeah, you know, eternal life is free. Yeah, it's free for us, but it costs God everything. It costs God everything. And to the Christian, I ask, why, do you, why are you following Jesus? You know, Matthew followed Jesus just because Jesus saved him. Why are you following Jesus? I'm not going to read this first, but it's in, it's, in, it's in John chapter 1. Two disciples were following Jesus. There were John's disciples right in the beginning. Jesus turned around and said, what do you want? 
What do you want me to do for you, basically? Are you following Jesus because you want something, or are you following Jesus because of what he did for you, because of, because of what he did, because, of, because you love him, you just want to worship him? Because if it's the first one, it's a problem. Like I said, God knows motives. You come to Jesus broken, and you say, Lord, I'm just here because of you. That's it. And then watch what God does in your life. I'm serious, watch what God does in your life. Um, one of the things that stood out for me was that Jesus sits with sinners. He sits with sinners. You know what? Jesus was never afraid to be around sinners. The Samaritan woman in John chapter, that was unheard of. Number one, she's a woman. Jews don't associate women, this woman, especially a rabbi. And number two, she was a Samaritan. She was a half-breed. She was a, a mix, basically. Lepers, tax collectors, adulterous women. Anyone you could think of, Jesus was around them. You know, archaeologists, and, and let, me, let me explain to you one thing. Matthew's office was in Capernaum. Capernaum is a town on the uh, northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. I've never been to Israel. I know a couple of people have. But the Sea of Galilee is like one big circle, basically. It's got ten cities around it. It's called the Decapolis. Capernaum is on the northeast corner of the Galilee. Many people know Jesus from Nazareth, right? But Jesus was born and raised in Nazareth. But the hometown of his ministry was Capernaum. That's where it was. Guess where Matthew's tax office was? Capernaum. You're like, how is it that Matthew just followed Jesus like this? Because he saw what Jesus did. He watched Jesus daily walk by him. Jesus didn't say anything until that day. And archaeologists believe Capernaum was also one of the biggest towns when it comes to fishermen. Peter, James, John, Andrew, they were all from there. Archaeologists believe that tax collectors taxed fishermen. What's the point I'm trying to make? What are you making, John? Could you imagine the first time they all got together? Peter, James, John, Andrew, Matthew. Matthew, Levi, the tax collector who taxed me. That got me excited because God brought two people from two different ends of the world and brought them together. Jesus breaks down barriers. You guys ever understand that? You know, the people that you think you can never love, all of a sudden you're like, I love that person for some weird reason. I don't know why. And that's, you know, he breaks down barriers. And, and as brothers and sisters, you know, there, there, there shouldn't be barriers between us, whether it's in this church or whether it's outside this church. He breaks them all down, whether it's denominational lines, whether it's everything. Because there's one common goal, right? And if I'm wrong, I'll step off the stage, close my Bible, and walk out. There's one common goal. Glorify Jesus. Amen. One common goal. And that's what I'm saying, is that Jesus brings everyone together. And he sits amongst the sinners. Now, what, when I read this, my mind works like this, and, and I always write myself questions in here that I think maybe you're thinking. So I wrote myself, why do you think Jesus brought them all together? Why is it that he chose 12 people, and one of them he called the devil, 12 people that were from all different areas of life? Why didn't he choose all good boys? Why? Because I think Jesus wanted us to understand that, you know what, there's no one righteous. No one. If you're coming in here and you're, you think you're righteous, I'm sorry, you're not. I'm not. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. I think what Jesus was saying is, you know what, there's only one perfect man and that's me. Everyone's a sinner. And I know sin's kind of a bad word now. Nobody says sin anymore. I just said sin like six times. So we need to start looking at each other through the eyes of God. You know, if you're having difficulty with someone, if you can't, if you're having trouble with a friend, trouble with someone, this is a prayer that I've used in the past, and you know what? By the grace of God, it's worked. I pray this, Lord, give me your eyes towards them. That's it. Because when I look at them through the eyes of God, God loves that person. I heard, I heard uh, a pastor once say, um, I don't like that person. I didn't ask you to like them, God says. Love them. 
love them. You see, in verse 15 it says, they followed him. The end of verse 15, it says, they, well, but why did they follow him? Because he was so gracious and loving. He was so great. Look, I say this in, to the youth, I'll say it here. You Christians that are out there, sometimes you're the only Bible people read. They look at you and you're like, oh, yeah, that's Matthew 5, 7, that's good. You're the light of the world. Okay. Okay, I understand what it says. But sometimes they say this, wow, you're the judgmental Pharisee. Yeah, no, it can't be. You see, in, in, in Colossians, the Bible says that our, our words must be seasoned with salt. And we have to be full of grace. Now, I'm not saying you see someone doing something wrong, let it go. No, no, no. We're called as brothers and sisters to point out each other's wrongs, to fix, to build together, not to break. Thank you. <laughs> Get excited. Ah, okay. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we read it before, but this verse is awesome. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of works, lest anyone should boast. Lest anyone should boast. The second thing we see is, you know what? He eats and drinks with sinners. Now, someone right now is like, see, that's my verse now. Eats and drinks with sinners. I could do that. No, 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 no. I say, time out. My boss does this. When I talk to her, she goes, time out, John. It annoys me. Sorry if it annoyed you. We have to be in the world, not of it. In the world, not of it. You know what that means? That means you get in the world, you're in the world, you live in the world. This is the way it is. You're in the world, you live in it. But you can't be like the world. It's almost like you have this protective bubble around you, but it's clear. People can see and people can actually get close to you. Don't say, you know, stay arm's length away from me. Don't come near me. I don't want your breath... What happens too many times is we Christians, we sometimes get sheltered. We only want Christian barbers, Christian hairdressers, Christian dentists, Christian plumbers. Our pets are Christians, and yes, my dog Lucky is a Christian. He is. He prays when we pray. No, he doesn't. <laughs> he knows he's going to get food afterwards, that's why. We need to get out there and start loving the world. We need to get out there and start loving the world. I don't mean the world, the people in the world. I love the world. No, not that world. The people. Um, Chuck Smith, who is in heaven right now, was a, a great pastor who honestly is responsible, I believe, for the last great revival in this country in 1970. I mean, from him alone, 1,400 churches blew up around the world. He, you know what he said? He said, healthy sheep produce more sheep. Are you a sheep? The Bible calls you sheep. Go produce more sheep. But you got to be healthy. What does that mean? It means you got to walk with him. you got to be obedient. It's just, it's just the way it is. But sometimes we stay in our corner. We can't produce more sheep. I love Jesus because the majority of his preaching, if you notice, was always outside. I think he loved the sea, personally. He was always by the Sea of Galilee. That was pretty much, I mean, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would be preaching in that Gentile, that Gentile region, basically, well, to the north and stuff. But he'd be preaching around the Galilee. But you know why I love? Because he was always outside. See, sometimes churches wait for sinners to come through the door. We got to go out and get some. We got to go out and get some. He went out and got them. We got to go out and get them, too. And look, this could be... Again, I know uh, the, the youth will tell their friends to come, and, and, and you know, we adults sometimes, we have to invite people too. We really do, and that goes for me too. I'm, I put myself right in front. We gotta invite people. Come, let me introduce you to Jesus. Why are you this way? I'll tell you why. Let me introduce you who made me this way. And this is gonna sound really bad, and don't hate me for saying this, but honestly, the worst place to share Jesus with someone is in church. People come here expecting to hear about Jesus. It's like going to heaven. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. He's right there. I can just go sit on his lap. It's just, you know, we have to be careful. Um, and we also have to be careful, like I said before, be in the world and not of it. There was a guy, 
I'm not, I don't even know who it is, but there was a man who tried to reach the lost, but the way he did it was very wrong. He said, I'm going to go to a bar. He's a pastor. I'm going to go to a bar. I'm going to have a beer and then a Bible study. That's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. I'm sorry. That's not how you do it. In John 17, 15, Jesus said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Jesus prayed for that. He didn't say take them out of the world. You know, pray, Lord, please come into my heart and then die. Go to heaven. That'd be great if you think about it. But that's not what it is. Jesus saved you, so you get out and bring some more people so he could save some more. And it just repeats, repeats, repeats. The last thing we're going to look... I'm doing good on time, actually. I skipped a lot, but I'm doing good on time. The last thing we're going to look at is found in verse 17. Jesus is a friend of sinners, and you know what? He does, he does what others can't. Again, we come back to the mission of Christ. The mission of Jesus is one thing. I know, you know, sometimes people fog up the mission. But Jesus' mission is found in Luke 9.56. It says that for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus came to save sinners. That's it. That was his mission. Because he knew man couldn't save himself. A person can't save you. Your things can't save you. Let me tell you something. When you're on your deathbed, you're going to look over to your thing and say, hey man, what do you think? He's going to be like, what are you looking at me for? I'm just a purse. Get away. Or someone else. It could be a human. Hey, can you? No, I can't do anything for you. But Jesus is standing there saying, what's the deal? Look at the, look at the holes in my hand. I said, it's for you. The blood I shed is for you because you can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. Stop trying to do it on your own. Only he can do that. Only he can do that. And he will to anyone that comes and believes that he died on the cross and rose for your sins and for mine. It's not a gimmick. It's not a game. It's not um, a magic potion, dust that we throw on you. You don't even have to come here. Just, you know what? I want to see you in heaven. I want to see you in heaven. And that's what breaks my heart because I see a lot of people today that are walking blindly in this world and they're just walking and walking and you know what? Things are coming at them. And, oh, this is so awesome. But there's so much pain inside and they're ignoring it. They're ignoring the pain. Stop ignoring the pain. Because there's only one that can truly give you the peace, the joy, the healing that you desire. His name is Jesus. That's it. Only he can do that. And I stand up here as witness and speak to anyone else that has tasted and seen how good the Lord is to them. And they're going to tell you the same thing. Because no one here will say, well, it was me. You know what? That's not God. That's not God. Someone that is full of the Holy Spirit will say, amen, it ain't me. I don't even know what's going on in my life. He's doing everything. I don't know. I'm like lost. And I love that. Does Jesus bless? Yes. He blesses. But that's not his goal. Jesus' goal is to save you. Even the Apostle Paul. Look, the great Apostle Paul, by the way, the um, historians say there's no greater writer than the Apostle Paul. None. He was intelligent, but you know what? Look, look at what he, this is the end of his life. This wasn't in the beginning of his life. 1 Timothy chapter 1. End, end. This is, I'm talking probably six months or maybe three months before he was beheaded in Rome. Look what he wrote. He said, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. But look what he says. And I am the worst of them all. This is a man that walked with Jesus how many years? And he said, I'm the worst of them all. And sadly, I'm sorry to say, but many, many preachers today, hey, look, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just here, you know, I, I love teaching to the kids, I'm, I'm nobody. 
But let me tell you something. Sometimes I watch things, I hear things. Many preachers just ignore sin. Ignore the blood. Ignore the cross. Well, you know what? If you ignore the blood, ignore the cross, ignore sin, then you might as well stop calling yourself a Christian. Because I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. You know, a lot of people, you know, just come to Jesus. But just believe. Believe what? What? What do you want me to believe? And, and this happened in the Old Testament too, and I'm just going to read this quickly in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse uh, 14 and 8, 11. Jeremiah said it twice. When something is written in the Bible two times, it's important. Two times. Look what he said. When, when you see the word they, those are the, uh, Jeremiah was a preacher, well, was a young preacher who was uh, called to preach in Jerusalem for 50 years, okay? By the way, his preaching got him nothing, but he kept preaching. 50 years he preached this kid. He was a kid. He was 16 when he was called. He was a kid, 50 years, and then he finally was, was uh, killed. 50 years. But during, of course, when the word of God goes out, there's also the other side. Because even Satan can mask himself as an angel of light. He could stand on a pulpit, be cute, hair back, nice suit, everything. And look what Jeremiah chapter 6 says. It says, now they are the preachers, those, old, those other prophets. They dress the wound of my people. They just dress it. They just put a band-aid on the wound, basically. They put a band-aid on it. And though it were not serious, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. It's the same today. There is no peace in this world. None. Peace is found right here. And his name is Jesus. Now let me tell you something. If you're going to ignore it, I, I don't know what to tell you. Because let me tell you something. Say, Satan would much rather take people from the church seats to hell than the streets. He wants Christians to come, or they think they're Christians. They come here, they sit, ah, oh, they're awesome. You know, their ears get tickled. <laughs> they laugh and they walk out. I know I said some jokes and I was goofy earlier. That's not the point. You know, when I read my Bible, and, and I pray you guys read your Bible too, I, I see what was important to James. I see what was important to John. I see what was important to Peter and Paul and Mary. Peter, Paul, Mary, you always have to say them together. I see what was important to these people. Every time Pete, someone said, how can one be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for remission of sins and you shall be saved. There's another verse Peter said, I love it. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be saved, shall be saved. Do you need to call upon the name of the Lord today? And, and just to finish off, the Pharisees always have to stick their nose in something, don't they? Pharisees are always there. You know, the Pharisees never liked Jesus, but they always popped up. Ah, Jesus, how are you? Where were you? They were in the weeds, hiding, following him, because they always wanted to find something wrong with him. I mean, Christians, today, you're, in the you're out there, you're in school, you're at work. You know that. People are hanging on every one of your words, trying to trip you up. You make sure you know your Bible very well. Because, and don't ever be afraid to say, I don't know, but I'll find out. No, don't say, I think. Someone once told me, don't say I think. Be sure. Say the, shush. I'm almost done. I, I promise I'm done. Don't say I think. Say the Bible says. Billy Graham once said, always answer someone the Bible says. Why? Because if they have a problem, let them go deal with God, not with you. Hallelujah. I'm serious. It's the easiest way. It's like a cop out. The Bible says. And what are they going to say? Did anybody watch the, the debate between Ken Ham and Bill Nye? Anybody? You guys watched that? What did, what did uh, Ken Ham always say? You know, there's a book out there. That should be your answer, too. You got a, you got a question about whatever. Dating, marriage, drugs. Yeah, there is about drugs in here. You say, wait a minute, I have a verse for you. The word Pharisee means separated ones. They were always separated from people. You ever notice that? They actually walked in long black robes. They covered themselves. They didn't even walk. Like if I was walking by Nicole right now, I would cover my pull my robe so my robe doesn't even touch her. 
That's how they were. They were separated. But Jesus was totally different. He was so engaging. He would touch people. He would come to a leper and he would lay his hands on a leper. People actually thought, that's disgusting. That's a sin. What are you doing? You have to go wash yourself now. But Jesus was like, I'm not here for that. I'm not here for the self-righteous. I'm here for those that need a doctor. Does anyone need a doctor in the house? I do. I need a doctor. I always need a doctor. Jesus is the complete opposite. I love Jesus. And, and you know what? He took a broken vessel, which is me, and he put it together with his blood. And that's what seals it now. I am nothing but a jar of clay. But you know what? There's a treasure in here. And there's a treasure in every Christian now. You gotta let the treasure out though. You gotta let the treasure out. Sometimes your jar has to crack a little bit. The light comes out. Jesus died for everyone. You know, a lot of people believe today that, you know what, God doesn't wanna save anybody. God doesn't wanna save everybody, excuse me. That's not true. God does wanna save everybody. Everyone should know this verse by heart. I'm serious. It's a very easy verse to remember. You know how you remember it? 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4. 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4. Anyone that says, well, God doesn't want to save everybody, say, ah, on the contrary. He does. 1 Timothy, you just go 1, 2, 3, 4. Very easy. 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4. It says, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved. It didn't say some, it said all, and come to the knowledge of the truth. Actually, 2 Peter 3.9 also says, God, uh, God is long-suffering and patient, who desires all men to be saved. Jesus was truly the friend of sinners. He still is today. He still is today. And if you come here and you're like, I, 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 I don't understand. I don't, it just doesn't make sense at all. I say to you, well actually the Bible says to you, come and let me take that burden off you, Jesus says. Let me give you rest. Because I died for you. Because I love you. Because only I can do what others can't. Only I will go where others won't. And only I see in you what others don't. So either you believe it, or you don't. That wasn't even part of it, and it rhymed. Only the, the young kids got that. That doesn't make sense, John. So, I close with this. There's only one God that calls his followers friends. And his name is Jesus.